for joining us for this afternoon discussion. I'm gonna go ahead and kick things off. My name is Jessica Robinson. I am co-founder and uh, board chair for the Michigan Mobility Institute. Really excited to have this discussion this afternoon with our participants focusing on the cybersecurity profession. Um, and it is not an accident that we're talking about cybersecurity. One of the things that we want to bring to everybody here today is the idea that there are lots of different opportunities for work in this field. Um, so Tamara, Samir, and Mark, thank you again for joining me for this discussion today. Uh, for those participants, as you're, you're jumping in, if you're already here, thanks for joining us on time. We do have both the chat and the Q&A enabled. Um, as, you go, as we go through this discussion today, if there are questions that you want to bring to the panel, please go ahead and log them there in the Q&A. We'll try to uh, work those into the discussion and then likely have a few dedicated minutes at the end of the conversation for Q&A. Um, I also wanna give a special thank you uh, this afternoon to the SAE Detroit section. Uh, you all have been a great partner for the Michigan Mobility Institute for this ongoing series of conversations about opportunities in mobility. mobility. We couldn't do this without you. And so we're going to kick things off here. I'm going to briefly introduce the panelists and then we'll actually have you go around and add a little bit more color commentary to your background. So joining me, we have Tamara Shoemaker. Tamara is the director of the Detroit Mercy Center for Cybersecurity and Intel Studies. Co Tamara, man, you got a lot here. Co-founder of the Michigan yeah, Center um, and Center of Excellence with the National Cyber Patriot Program at Michigan Cyber Patriot. I'll have you also explain what CISSE is. Uh, we also have Dr. Samir Tout, who is Professor of Information Assurance at the School of Information Security and Applied Computing uh, at Eastern Michigan. And we have Mark Zakos, who's president of DG Technologies. So a couple educators and a practitioner in the field. Tamara, I'm gonna throw the question back to you. Uh, tell us a little bit more about the work that you actually do. You're involved in so many different programs. What, what are the things that you're most excited about? Do tell us what that acronym means. And then also in your introduction and, and Mark and Sumir, this is a heads up for you. Tell me also what your kind of aha moment was in your own professional career where you realized that cybersecurity is what you wanted to work on. Absolutely. So I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the Center of Academic Excellence. So in 2004, the University of Detroit Mercy became a center of excellence with the NSA and DHS as the second center in the state. We now have 13, so we're really very fortunate in Michigan to have that many academic partners. MSISI is actually that. In 2005 and 2006, we started to uh, grow our community uh, as part of being a, a center of excellence with NHS and DHS. You had to make sure that other folks were in the tent and then knew about cyber because back then we didn't. It was just becoming a burgeoning thing, just new. Um, and so we made sure that all the community colleges and universities around knew what cybersecurity was, knew what the federal government wanted us to teach, and sort of kind of went out there and, and did that. And then that's actually my job. So that's part of my hat, right? So I do the community outreach. And so that's why there are so many titles and so many things involved in the things that I'm doing, from uh, being a board member on InfraGuard to the director of our center. And so I work with all of the community outreach. I do all the government and, and, and you know entities. Uh, academic entities, business entities, all of that kind of stuff. But my main passion right now is, is the Cyber Patriot piece, right? So, and that's really got me reinvigorated, right? So I'm used to working with older students in the grad program, which is what our, our, our capstone program, what our first program was in cyber. Um, and now I get to work with these shiny pennies, these middle school and high school kids, and even the elementary kids, um, and introduce cyber uh, security in that career field and what that can bring to them. And so that's my main push right now. It is definitely, like I said, reinvigorated me since I've been doing this in 2006. Um, it's been really a really cool uh, journey. I actually came from the physical security side. So I was a PI, a private investigator for 12 years, ran my own firm. And then my husband, who uh, Dr. Samir is, has been so sweet to uh, mention his multiple uh, donations to the science in this area because he has, I don't know, 13 or 14 books now in the area, my husband, Dr. Shoemaker. Um, uh, I, he needed help in the, the center. And um, I had really gotten tired of uh, doing physical 
uh, private investigation work and I had already been sort of moving into data information more because it's a whole lot easier for me to look on the internet and find a, find a paper trail for somebody then go through their garbage and try to figure out what it is that they're doing wrong. And so it, it just made sense. I started to take six certification classes and kind of retooled myself and then helped out at the center and helped that grow. And so it's been a really great ride. Um, Eastern was the third center to become a, a center in the state. So it's really cool that you, know, you have uh, uh, Smear on as well. So he can, he can talk about their, their program as well. But the CAE or the MCC is the, that group. So it's the community colleges and the universities that are all now pulling in the same direction to try to bring cybersecurity awareness and career uh, awareness to the forefront. And that's what I'm all about. That's great. Thank you so much, Tamara. And yes, I can imagine this is a little more invigorating than uh, literally going through people's trash. Uh, <laughs> that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, Samir, we'll, we'll ask you to go next uh, since Tamara mentions you here. Tell us a little bit more about your day to day and uh, when you knew this was the right field for you. Oh, thank you, uh, Tamara, for uh, paving the way for my uh, start, starting statement. Um, I joined EMU in 2009. Uh, prior to that, I uh, was actually an industry practitioner. I, I have about 15 years of industry uh, experience, ranging from development to um, architecture and, uh, and other aspects of IT-specific type of uh, professional practice. Then I started moving into the security world, and this opportunity opened up in 2009 here at EMU, and I joined the faculty ranks and uh, since then I have not regretted even a moment of having joined because I found this as a great avenue to really apply a lot of what I had practiced before but in a more academic and more structured way and at the same time convey that to the, the young minds and, and see how much they can do with that and it's been really enriching. It's been a very fulfilling to see what they were able to do. Um, I have uh, also participated uh, in uh, the past several years in uh, uh, grant proposals to the National Science Foundation, and we were awarded a, a grant in 2014 um, jointly with uh, Merit and U of M, and it was mostly about detecting anomalies in uh, uh, smart grid environments and, you know, trying to address those potential threats that may befall the cyber physical systems. And that's when it, this whole feeling of, you know, belonging, so to speak, into cybersecurity even got even more or stronger. And um, started out to the community, um, did some out of code out with some of the schools. I was taken aback with some of what I saw in the little kids, you know, uh, the, the middle schoolers and, and, uh, and even some elementary uh, schoolers that, that were able to actually connect with some of the fundamental concepts in, in computing. And some also started talking about some aspects that are related to security. So I'm like, you know what, we can connect with these kids. We can start introducing this stuff to them early on. And then I worked internally. EMU has been uh, doing outreach uh, efforts for the past uh, decade uh, in, in a program called Digital Divas. So I was involved in that in the early days of that where um, hundreds of high school girls are brought in and now actually got extended to middle schoolers. And they come in, they get exposed to technology, cybersecurity, and then again, they innovate. So this all this big experience has been very in, enriching to me. And, and as you can see in my background, possibly that this is my lab for vehicle cybersecurity. And I've been focusing on mobility, cybersecurity and autonomy uh, in the past uh, four or five years. And um, we were fortunate to get a, a grant, a $1 million grant from MEDC um, uh, to purchase some uh, state of the art equipment and to be able to take this uh, Lab to the next uh, level. Also recently, we got support from Gabe, Game Above, who are key players now, um, and, and the, a group of alumni who wanted to uh, take uh, help take Eastern to the next level. And they've uh, just invested $5 million in, in our College uh, of Engineering Technology, now Game Above College of Engineering Technology. 
So uh, this whole, uh, I really feel I belong in this world, but I really want to also convey the idea to others to see what's out there, what cybersecurity provides, great opportunities, great opportunities for students, great opportunities for um, and new practitioners, even existing practitioners as well. That's great. Thank you so much. And uh, it's very clear. Uh, I, this was immediately apparent to me when we had our, our discussion in advance of, of this presentation today, how passionate you all are about this space. And it's, it's very clear that you all found found your place in this industry. Uh, so Mark, we'll, we'll have you run things out here. Tell us a little bit more about your work, your day to day. And again, um, when was that moment that you knew this was the right place for you? Yeah, I appreciate that question. Um, and the idea uh, that I'll relate to you first is, you know, what do I do? I have a day job. Um, I run a company, we're in Farmington Hills, Michigan, and it's uh, automotive technology, automotive communications and diagnostic technology. Um, so things that uh, your uh, viewers might relate to that we work on here is uh, underneath the dashboard of your car that you drive, every car, there's a connector there. It's a 16 pin connector. There's actually an SA standard, uh, J1962 is the SA standard. So we work, uh, my day job is we make things that plug into that connector on that car that you drive and uh, allow the mechanic who's, or technician who's working on that car to read information to figure out what's wrong with the vehicle. So that's uh, also known as OBD2. And uh, so th that's what I do for a, a living. I have, a, I have an afternoon job, if you will, and, and also an evening job, so I'm pretty busy. Uh, I, I would call my afternoon job is uh, my SAE committees that, that I collaborate in and participate in. So that OBD2 connector, I was one of the guys who, uh, one of the people who actually uh, used uh, that knowledge of, of how the vehicle talks to the outside world and develop the, the SA standard for uh, OBD2. So I, a small part, I'm not the only guy, there's a lot smarter people than myself, but I collaborated on that SA committee. And working forward from that, there's many more SA standards of how vehicles communicate uh, and connect to the outside world, both wired through a connector and wirelessly. So working through SAE has been a, a great opportunity to enhance uh, my knowledge and, and learn from other people who, uh, in that, that know what they're doing uh, in that level of communication. And then uh, you know, further on from that, I, I do uh, teach and uh, taught at Wayne State, University of Michigan, Dearborn, uh, uh, classes related to that, uh, undergrad classes related to that, and through, uh, now through uh, one of my um, projects through SAE is uh, called CAN Bus Hacking, how to hack into that OBD connector that I talked about inventing, uh, helping invent. Now, the aha moment that you had asked me about uh, really occurred to me uh, during that uh, thought process here. Uh, when we created that OBD2 connector and we created that communication, all those professionals, uh, engineers here in, in, in the automotive industry, we had no idea that something malicious or somebody would use, abuse, uh, take the, the standard and take that technology that we had created to help you as a consumer uh, fix cars and mechanics uh, help uh, upgrade and keep your cars up to uh, running uh, correctly, properly. How would somebody possibly want to hack in there and, and break it and do, do something bad? We had no idea that that would ever occur to us. And uh, I'm talking, you know, 25 years ago. So when I see people and read people and the hacking that's going on, uh, you know, it's very interesting to me to understand um, 
these the researchers that are learning about these things but the other part of that story is that we had no idea of course they were able to hack in there we had no idea uh, that anybody would try that so my my message then would be to say well up front let's let's create standards that are secure that we think about those things and as we're as we're going through and educating our 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 students uh you know let's have them think about that up front we were missing that 25 years ago we didn't even occur to us that's great mark i really really appreciate that that story um and the honesty too right because it, it speaks to where the industry, how quickly I think the industry has evolved as we think about connecting um, all sorts of devices, but I think most notably for this group, the, the car and, and the vehicles themselves. Um, I actually wanted to stick with that idea and I'll throw this next prompt out to, to the entire group and anyone who feels moved, please uh, feel free to respond. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's, I mean, it's very clear that you all live, live and breathe this stuff every day. Um, but among our participants here, I suspect we have a range of folks with different backgrounds, engineers, IT professionals, probably some students. Um, I'd be very excited if there's any middle school students that found their way to us this afternoon, but you never know. Um, and again, I think that speaks to, uh, as this industry continues to, to merge and grow, um, people from all sorts of backgrounds are, are coming to the table. Um, but there's probably folks that are on the, the call that really haven't given cybersecurity much thought. Maybe it's an afterthought. Um, maybe they <laughs> actively avoid some of it because it's, it's annoying and a headache as they're working on designing their product and their service. Um, what would any of you say to folks here on the call that uh, maybe don't know or, or don't care about cybersecurity as much as you all do. Um, why should they? And maybe a flip side of that question is what makes it interesting to you as a field to continue to spend so much time and energy? Well, for me, I know that education is expensive, right? And and uh, and 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 living living is expensive. And so cybersecurity, there are jobs, 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 right? No unemployment. You make at least ten percent, if not more. Uh, than a normal IT person. And to be honest with you, uh, what both Samir and Mark talked about was that we didn't have an adversary before. We have an adversary now and they don't rest. They're making boatloads of money, right? Um, and it used to be just that they were hitting only big corporations, not small small folks or you and I. And I remember thinking, they're actually making this comment maybe five or 10 years ago, well, they're never gonna get me, I'm an academic, we don't make very much money. But now they're even working on small people, mom and pops, mom, you know, our grandparents, you know, all, everybody, right? Stimulus check uh, uh, problems, you know, uh, you know, it, everyone. And so we need everybody in the fight. Um, we need everyone to be involved in this. And even if this isn't something that you think you could do as a career, we need you to at least be cybersecurity aware. And so that way you're not sort of fighting what some of us are trying to do, right? So like you said, that port, right? You know, I, I've gotten advertisements on on the, the web that say, here's this little thing that you can put into that port and it'll track your miles. I know, I know. It'll track your miles and help you be a better driver and, and, and. And it's like, hold it, wait a minute. That's not something authorized. We don't know at all what's in that and who's, Who's, who it's radioing to, but it's there and it's, you know, they're in their dirt cheap, right? right. Um, and so suddenly, you know, we have an attack, attack place that we had, we didn't used to have, right? And so we need more people into this pipeline. It is a critical problem right now. We have in the state of Michigan, we have 8,000 open jobs right this moment that need to be filled. And so jobs, jobs, jobs. So bad guys, yes, really, really bad thing, but also really lots of opportunities. Yeah, if I may, uh, I guess piggyback on uh, what Tamara mentioned. I, I, I guess where do I start? Is, is the first thing that comes to my mind is um, we're in a new era that is witnessing really incessant and new types of cyber attacks. It's it's no longer the old traditional easy to solve type of attacks. They're, they're getting even more complex. And let's keep in mind that these attacks now are affecting everyone. Um, so now it is getting down to the personal safety um, and, and that of the family. 
um, I think identity theft, blackmailing, et cetera. Attacks are increasing in sophistication um, and, and putting us um, on the defensive, uh, the practitioners, the educators, and, and, and all of us really out there. Um, they're increasingly having major impact on, on businesses, large and small, um, and of every size, sometimes even leading to loss of jobs, unfortunately, even sometimes maybe a loss of life. And, and that's the kind of thing that we have to really keep in mind. This is a crucial, I wouldn't say even, even crucial, it's vital for everyone to consider cybersecurity as, as a field. Businesses currently are practically scrambling to find cybersecurity talent. And, and this is a field that is one of the best to get into at this time, along with other fields, of course. But there is a place for everyone, like Tamara was saying, and, and it's almost zero unemployment. So there's no better field really to get into at this point um, from our slightly biased opinion than cybersecurity. But there is a lot of data that backs what we're saying. It's not really out of thin air. It's, it's very vital for everyone to consider cybersecurity. And it's very important for our um, safety, for our security um, at, at the individual, at the social, at the national level, and even international level. Thanks. Mark, go ahead. I see you unmuted as well. <laughs> well, I'm going to offer up maybe um, a, a thought that uh, might be sound contradictory, but it's not that hard. Cy being cyber secure is not that hard. It's it's a practice. It's a it's a process. It's a regiment, and it needs to be reinforced. Uh, so there's got to be some policies uh, within organizations that not only are set but are followed. And you know, if you don't follow them, there's consequences. So why would I want to get into that game anyway? Um, uh, from a technical point of view, well, I work on cars, I work on car electronics and that sort of thing. From that point of view, it's not that really difficult. If you, if you really want to get into ciphering and you know computation, the high math about the elliptical curves and all the different uh, algorithms, yeah, that's, that's really, really smart people. But from a level of, um, you know, a baseline level, what we really need is people to understand that when you develop a password, it's got to, you, you got to have a, a strong password, right? So you need something to enforce that. And then how does that work? How does it all two-factor authentication? How do you implement that? There's certain functions and features that are, are not that hard to to follow, but you know, as as Tamara said, why why do they go after the criminals? Go after the the uh, uh, let's say the unprotected, right? Like my mother, eighty seven year old mother. It's because not that they're rich, but they you know th their passwords, if they have them, are one two three four, right? Or why did that that little plug in you know, OBD thing that you mentioned, why is that so easy to hack? Well, if you open it up, there's a JTAG port that is easily <laughs> connected to that you can extract all the source code out. And then it, it's not that hard to do. Engineers, uh, software engineers, uh, electronic engineers today know how to do that. They do that day in and day out for their 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 real job. All we need to do, I think, I believe is just up their game, we got to put them in a cyber secure frame of mind. And when you release that code, you got to be conscious of the supply chain and where that gets up. There's all sorts of details there, but uh, I think it, there's there's lots of opportunity and there's lots of places that uh, there's not, it, it, we can really make this world a lot more secure with just that little much more work that we do internally in our day jobs. That's right. Thanks, Mark. Um, if this panel doesn't uh, scare us all to go change that one password that's been lingering out there. Um, I think we have failed. It's certainly something I've been thinking about since we uh, since we last got together. Um, I actually want to stick. Let's stick with this idea for a second of the the bad actors that are out there. Um, I think back to my time at Ford when I was walked through the. Um, kind of cybersecurity war room by the, the chief information security officer. 
Um, and frankly, I was horrified at the, um, the big screen that showed where all of the attacks were coming from, the state actors, uh, the other actors as well, um, and just the volume of attacks that were coming into the company's very assets, including the laptop, which of course I was super frustrated that I had a complex VPN to get in and check my email. Um, but I understood a little bit more in that second of why that matters. Um, within cybersecurity though, yes, we know some of those you know, stories that make the news, um, but you know, there's also kind of this, I think Mark, you call it a dark side where you know, it might seem fun or interesting to try and see if you can hack into this or get into this, or maybe, Tamara, what was the example you used? A nephew kind of looking over someone's shoulder and, and borrowing a password. Um, that stuff seems like not a big deal until it becomes a big deal, right? So what are some of the, um, I don't know, the, the cautions that you'd have, mistakes that you've seen, you know, well-intentioned people make um, as they are intrigued by this world of cybersecurity um, so that, you know, we can again think of all being kind of in this fight together. So Mark, Mark hit on it, right? It's not complicated. It, it's complicated as we think it is, right? Well, you, right, you're right about that. There are really complicated jobs that that smear are, are you're probably you know getting your kids ready to do it, at your school. But it's it's really about cyber hygiene, right? So the, the story that I told you uh, uh, before was my grandson, right, sitting on my grand my husband's lap playing Angry Birds with him, and my husband, I mean, he was only four, you know, and he was you know, typing in his password when he wanted to get some golden feathers or whatever it is you get with that thing. And then my grandson had the iPad to himself and then knew what the password was because he was sitting with grandpa the whole time. Shoulder surfing is what we call that in the biz. Um, he didn't know that was what he was doing, right? But because they're growing up with this stuff in their hands, we need to make sure that we teach them the ethics of using our technology and when and how to protect themselves when they go on the internet and it has to happen early and often right and as mark said passwords are still number one problem uh clicking on uh, attachments and 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 getting yourself uh, a viruses are still you know the main thing in employment right these are buffer overflow is still the main thing with programming you know i mean we we just need to get it right right <laughs> uh, but it, but again it's following i love the way you, you explained it mark it's following good procedures right and good security right <laughs> absolutely well that we didn't have a, we didn't have bad actors before we do now and they know all the tricks and so in fact i just read an article this morning that right now one one quarter of the vulnerabilities and or the attacks that we have right now are brand new today, right? So we don't even know how to fight them, let alone protect ourselves from them. But if we take those good security things and do those things, and we also teach that just because you can do it doesn't mean you should. So when I'm talking to my cyber patriot kids at all levels at the camps and 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 during the competitions, I tell them just because you should can doesn't mean you should, right? So right, even right. if they can reverse engineer the game, that's not how you win the game. You win the game by protecting the corporation. You don't do it by nefarious ways, unless you want to wear an orange jumpsuit and and you know go to prison now because that is what's going to happen now. One, one the top attack, as you say, the the most common cyber attack is through emails and attachments and click here and and you know. I think 80, 90% of successful attacks start that way. The number two avenue is the insider attack, right? So just as you mentioned the ethics and the, just think about that as, you know, if I do a take shortcut and uh, no one's gonna catch me, right? Um, we have to frame that up as a, as a community. There's got to be a way for us to stand together to say this is, this is not the right way to do it. Um, part of that, I think, is still missing. We have the technical approach, but how do we combine that with that ethical side? That's really an important ingredient that we have to work on harder. Yeah, if I may add, uh, <clears throat> I, I guess, to... Uh, Along the same lines, that obviously the word ethics uh, comes to the forefront, and um, we did realize that we did realize that a while ago, 
and, and like my colleagues mentioned, we realized that we really need to work very hard on this because the tools that we teach to our students make them feel more powerful. And, you know, powerful can spoil people at the end of the day, you know, that, and that's where we need to step in and then say, look, you know, this is not a tool to use for the dark side. Just, you know, you can become a, a CEO if you use it in the right way. You can become a CISO, you can do this and that. And, and that's, uh, you know, students, at, they're, they're smart, they're curious. They're not necessarily driven by malicious intent. Um, but sometimes they do interesting things. And then uh, early on in our program that they did a couple of interesting things, let's say that our EMUIT said, look guys, you're gonna be on your own network. We're just uh, isolating our network from you. And now we live on our own network at the university, uh, the information assurance network. And that's a good thing. You know, that, that way we're able to let the students improvise, but still within the confines of a framework, ethical framework. So what we did is we actually turned hacking into ethical hacking. We integrated ethics into every single offering that we have in, in, in our courses, especially those that have more of a penetration test, testing and, and more of an offensive type of uh, security uh, nature. Even in, in some of the events that we are involved with, and, and Mark has been on these uh, events with me with Cyber Auto, that uh, when I was mentoring some of the students there from high school, very bright kids, and uh, offering them some tools. And then along the way, uh, you know, we kind of throw in this one tool that allows them to do jamming as an option. And jamming is illegal. But we explain to them that this is illegal. This is illegal. This is legal. You can use these. And then we let them loose. And then we monitor and see, you know, are they actually using the correct tools? We provide them with the guidelines. They actually accomplished a lot without even having to use a jamming tool. They realize that. So that's the way I think we need to drive our teaching to the students is to make sure that they understand that they can accomplish a lot if they use the right tool, the, the legal tools, and then stay within the legal framework. And like Tamara said, we don't, you know, if they want to end up, we explain to them, if you want to end up with a, in a jumpsuit for the rest of your life and behind bars, or you want to make it big in, in the industry, the choice is yours. We obviously encourage you to make it big in the industry and, and that's the way to do it. That's great, thank you. Um, and again, really, I think very uh, practical, real world examples. Um, you all are on the front lines and you see this every day. Um, I wanna turn to a question um, in the Q&A. Um, we actually have a couple, but I, I wanna stick with this one um, that just came in because it's relevant to this discussion. Um, and this idea that cybersecurity is a mindset, a methodology and a practice. Um, so, and the question is around, you know, is it, is it not difficult to design systems to protect against breaching techniques that haven't been used yet? As a, maybe as an industry and as practitioners, how, how do you even go about predicting the unknown? Um, I would say, Tamara, you said there's only, you know, a quarter that are new techniques. So I say, okay, good. Let's start with the 75% that we know how to address and, and start with a good foundation. But how do you how can you possibly know the unknown and find where these new um, weaknesses and holes are coming in? You can't because humans are involved. Um, and like Mark said, you know the humans, the soft squishy bits between the computer and the and the keyboard are the ones that are in control here, right? But again, what Mark said earlier about being systematic about this teaching, you know, it's just like um, uh, I had a friend who jokingly said his children uh, learned about hygiene because we got a pandemic. Um, you know, suddenly they're washing their hands, <laughs> you know, and so we're, we're, that's happening. So this is a trillion dollar industry for the bad guys, right? And so we're losing money. We're hemorrhaging money. Our, our businesses are hemorrhaging. Our people are hemorrhaging. They're going after the weakest population, right? So the senior citizens are being hit. Everybody's being hit. We're hemorrhaging. We, we need to do something differently, right? And so we, and we can by systematically taking care of it and, and just following good protocols. Um, and if you start there, you're, you're taking your, your attack surface and making it much smaller, right? And so that's what we have to work on is making our attack surface much smaller. 
Um, my husband used to say, it's okay if I, if I have mine, mine, mine under control and I'm not the weakest link, they'll go after the weakest link. But we want all of it to be okay because our infrastructure depends on our infrastructure depends on this. And so we need to be safe. We all need to work together to do that um, in a systematic kind of approach. And that's the, that's the reason that we became centers of excellence, Samir, right? So the NSA and DHS came down with, with the systematic way of doing things. You know, they have, uh, they, they also have, they have standards, right? Mark, you're into standards, we're into standards. Following that, there are educational standards around this. There are re really good ways to do it. And we, if we just all get together and we decide that it's important enough. And I think cyber hygiene is as important as health hygiene. Um, I would fully agree. I mean, that's that's definitely a, uh, the, the key word that Tamara just used, you know, the, the hygiene that needs to be, um, you know, kind of spread around that awareness, uh, rather, that needs to be spread across all the, the different segments and including, you know, the grandpa and the grandma and, and at least, you know, maybe varying levels, but uh, we need to spread awareness. And, and uh, another keyword that Tamara used is the weakest link, and that's us humans. And at the end, if we don't spread awareness and we don't collectively work together, to, to make sure that everyone is aware even of the little incidents that sometimes lead to very larger, like much larger incidents that are, uh, that are causing uh, companies to, you know, their systems to fail uh, just because someone released a password or used a weak password. So there was this effort that we did here on campus where we formed a committee uh, that I co-founded with another colleague here uh, to spread awareness, cybersecurity awareness committee is what we called it. And then we spent a couple of years working with our campus community to, uh, to help spread some of the very basic concepts and fundamental concepts like password hygiene, like Mark mentioned earlier. And, and it was amazing how much uh, need there was. And even better, it was, it was very interesting how much improvement we achieved in a couple of years after continuously spreading that awareness. So awareness and education definitely are, are fundamental to this. That, that's an interesting uh, point there because uh, what I was going to say is, okay, you can have awareness and you can wash your hands, but if your mother or father is not looking over, hey, did you wash your hands today, right? So you need someone there to reinforce or be the enforcer. Um, and how, how do we how do we manage that in, 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 in the world that we're talking about here? And, and maybe part of the answer is uh, researchers such as yourself, Samir, and other uh, cybersecurity researchers, they're, they're showing you through this ethical hacking and penetration testing that uh, they do and they have fun doing it. And uh, to your point, Tamara, they make a lot of money at it, right? So those people enjoy doing that and they teach us and they show us and they make us aware that, hey, you've got a broken uh, uh, software function here because the buffer overflows every time you do this, this, and this, and then the thing crashes and, and, and so on, right? And unless somebody's there, everybody says, yeah, I wash my hands. Yeah, don't worry about it, right? So it's, uh, we need that. And, th and that's an important component that we got to talk about further. So we got to learn from, you know, your stories. That's great. And, and I think too, you know, one of the other areas of course is, is new technology, right? At one point cars did not have OBD2 ports. Um, at one point um, cars will have something new uh, that we can't even imagine discussing on this call. And it, so I think the other point that really resonates with me is making, in the practice, making these considerations part of the design. And yeah, the design. I, I can assure you that all of the designs and the, all the autonomous vehicles and the self-driving cars, and I can, I can assure you that there's the best people in the business working on that, working on security issues day in and day out. So those vehicles that you're going to be driving in, in the back seat and the robots, you know, taking you where you want to go are going to be as safe as they possibly can, much safer than actually the way that uh, 
I drive. So. Than the, the cars that we have today. No, I th and, and that's, what, that's exactly the point, right? They're part of the design team from the beginning. I think about also some of the startups that I'm around in my day job. Um, you know, we see all sorts of connected devices um, and, you know, your small team. It's hard to take those things into account, but there was a, a comment in the chat about bio data too, right? Our health data, um, it all inter it starts to intertwine. Um, and I can guarantee you there's many startups not thinking about these questions. So maybe uh, they and we all should be too. Um, thank you for those that have thrown questions in the Q&A. Uh, please continue to use that as a, a venue to participate in this discussion. Um, I wanna move to maybe something else important in this idea of who's at the table in the design team. And when this group got together and we talked uh, in advance of the discussion, we talked about the importance of diversity in this field. Um, and as, as with engineering and as with IT, um, it's an area that I think we all recognize there's still an opportunity for improvement. Um, and so my question really in the spirit of diversity is in, in the work that you all have done, are there examples that come to mind where because of the diversity of the team, there was a different perspective or a different solution that someone raised and it ultimately made the product, the service, the defense plan better. Um, because I think that, you know, that those are, that helps make the idea concrete for this aspiration that certainly I have, and I think many of us share to, to have diverse teams. Well, maybe I could offer one thought here on our, in our company, uh, the, we do, uh, develop products, both uh, hardware devices and software uh, applications. Um, those products are used by, you know, technicians to help fix cars, but there's also a use case for consumers and folks like ourselves. Um, one thing that comes to mind is that, you know, in thinking uh, as a, you know, a wrench turner, mechanic, you know, you do this, this, and that. And then one lady in our uh, software development team said, well, what if, and again, that's, a, that's a, nobody would think about that, but her background was in uh, uh, psychology. Her background was in a different, not in any way associated with uh, car repair. And it's like, oh, why would anybody ever do that? But yeah, you're right. That's a possibility. We better <laughs> design something uh, to uh, channel that in the right direction, right? That's great. Thanks, Mark. That's one of the things I work real hard at with the, you know, but now that I'm more been focusing on the K through 12 space, um, uh, you know, in, in the schools is making sure that we hit a diverse population, right? Because guess what? Bad guys, they're diverse. They're not coming at this same way. There's not one size fits all attack. You know, they're doing it every way they can from any angle they can, right? So they're thinking of all of those things. They're doing all those innovations. They're pushing all the buttons that we don't, you know, but that's not the way we're, you know, it was designed to do. And so we need people in the fight that are going to do that. And so how I do that is by making sure that all of my instructors and my volunteers and folks that are there helping look like my diverse population and have those, those, that knowledge and skill and show them the way, right? And show them that they can do that. It, it's 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 a proven fact that it's that we lose our 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 females in middle school to any stem uh career field and so digital divas is an amazing example of that right that what we're doing in cyber patriot is an amazing example of trying to change that that so that we can because again the bad guys aren't doing that they're not saying oh you, you're just a girl we're not going to have you be the super hacker here you know or you know you're a, a, an african-american so you're not on the team no if you've got the skills you're on the team and so we need to make sure we go out and actually do that and the other thing is the other the cultural lens right so mark you mentioned that seeing it differently so we, we have people who are coming from all over the world that are attacking us. They're not just US citizens, although there are, right? And so they have different cultural things. Like uh, it, it was a, a while when um, my, my husband has been teaching for 36 years, a professor. Uh, and um, one of the things that was different about some of his foreign students were um, uh, they would, when they were on an exam, they would say word for word what he wrote in his chapter as the answer for a question. 
And he would say that that's wrong. You didn't use, you didn't actually apply the knowledge and give it to me in your own words. Well, in their culture, if you uh, memorized the instructor's word for word, that meant you were paying homage to his knowledge and that you understood he was the expert. And so, no, that wasn't at all failing great. You know, that wasn't, they didn't not get the answer. They got the answer perfectly, right? And so, uh, and in their mind, that was the answer. So they're going to go forth and do it exactly that way. So they, uh, maybe they're actually doing it, you know, a little bit better. I don't, we don't know, but the cultures are important. So we really need to tap into all those, all those different cultures, all that different things. If we ever hope to do something differently, right? We're using the same, uh, you know, we're, we're always fighting the war before instead of what's in front of us and, and using the tools that we have at hand. And so, you know, 50% of the population is female. We, we, we need to have them in on this, right? We, we need to have as many diverse things as we can. And I'm sure for me, Samir has got some examples of that as well. Well, absolutely. Um, unfortunately, the popular culture has it that the typical person um, that we see working in cybersecurity is a man wearing a hooded sweatshirt and Unfortunately, it's estimated that uh, females only constitute 20 or less percent of cybersecurity experts out there. And uh, we're, we, like, like my colleagues mentioned, we, we are dealing with more creative types of attacks that are coming from all over the world, internally and externally. And we need more diverse way of thinking. And, and women bring a new dimension into the approach that I've always uh, uh, personally I, I get excited when I see more women in the classroom because I give them the floor as much as I give the guys out there. And I would see very clearly the diversified and enriching way that they address the topics. So it's not only male driven. And let me give you an example here. That there was as part of the cyber auto that, uh, uh, that we participated in uh, Mark and I before. And uh, there was this young lady who uh, was a senior in high school. And she was actually an international student. She was from Africa. And um, she was initially, she was fairly intimidated. She did not want to touch anything. She um, uh, let the guys speak on the team. She was the only uh, uh, female on the, on the team. And then I sat with her, explained to her the details and went through some of it. And once she felt uh, comfortable with the topics, she actually I went up the, 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 the ladder of that group and then became the team lead. And there was a discussion that I actually witnessed in the background. I was sitting as a mentor and I you know, kind of triggered the conversation between them. And there was this guy saying, no, we need to use a brute force attack, you know, just hit it hard and we'll solve the problem. It's like, no, you know, how about we use a man in the middle attack? And I'm like, you know what? She got it. She nailed it. And she actually led to breaking the actual car at the end. And she was the star of that experiment that they ran. And so there you go. I mean, that, that's really um, diversity at work. A female really proving to be the leader of the team to, to providing much more valuable um, uh, design conversations and, and, and at the end, shining. So we just have to bring more of those experiences further and further uh, to the younger generation, right? So further uh, down into the grade levels, as you, as you well know, right? I'm not telling you anything new, but the, the, the topic always comes up. And again, I guess it's, it's just the practice. We, we have to reinforce what you're doing, Tamara, and what you mentioned there, the cyber auto challenge, right? My daughter went through that. I, I shared that experience with you. And, uh, you know, she was very angry with us as parents. We took her, you know, one week in August, you know, that she had to, you know, give up her summer vacation during high school. She was turning 16 that week. And we put her in this camp over there. And uh, at the end, uh, you know, I, uh, we went to pick her up and she held our hands walking out to the car and she says, mom, dad, I want to be a hacker. So I'm very proud of that. And she's now a sophomore uh, uh, studying uh, computer engineering and cybersecurity. That's, that's, and it's also, I think, a really good example of um, maybe sometimes it doesn't take that much either, right? It's this idea of the, the spirit and the practice 
and the exposure and even just having that conversation yeah. um, mm -hmm. to say, you know, why don't, why don't you try this too? Um, and I, I do love the focus on the younger generation. Obviously many of you, again, are deeply involved in programs with youth, um, whoever, whoever we are, and wh whether we have kids, work with kids, no kids, um, there's probably some way that we can also support this message of cyber awareness and, and cyber hygiene um, among that younger generation too. Um, so uh, I think that's one takeaway that we can all um, we can all have with this discussion today. Uh, we only have a few minutes left. I want to make sure it, to cover at least the one other question that came in through Q and A. Maybe we'll have time for two. Um, this is more of a philosophical question, I think, um, but I'm going to try and make it concrete. So the, the question our attendee was asking is, who has the authority to control and access our data? Um, so the, the way I'd phrase, frame that question for the panel here is um, whether we're a cybersecurity professional or not today, um, as you think about your own personal life, your home, your connected devices, your car, who has access to one set of that information? And with your cybersecurity hat on, um, how would you encourage us to be more mindful about who has that access to data? So maybe make it concrete. And if you want to react to the, the broad question of who has access and authority over this information, feel free, but recognize we only have five minutes left. That's a really hard question. I mean, ultimately the owner of the of uh, the data is the person who produced that data and that the data uh, is basically uh, either describing them or, or uh, is related to their own uh, private information and so on. But unfortunately nowadays we see a lot of that being spread out and this is the cybersecurity hat that a lot of it is no longer uh, safeguarded as it should be and with a very uh, uh, innocent intent, I would say, that, that people are just releasing their own personal data to various types of apps that are out there. And uh, basically, that's where we lose control, is, is when people um, uh, basically release their data easily uh, to various uh, channels that may be basically phishing uh, attempts, trying to compromise their uh, privacy and so on. So it goes back to the, to the, uh, to the awareness, spreading the awareness and, and may, making sure that we educate people that don't give up your data, don't lower your guard around your personal data easily. Um, just make sure that you, know, uh, uh, you check and double check and triple check uh, of who is requesting your data. And only after that, you're, you allow that to be released. I talk to the kids about that all the time when we're when I'm with these, these these kids, right? These middle school, high school kids, grade school kids. And it's like we we give away our data, right? So it's like, why on earth when I uh, download a free app as a flashlight, does it need to know my location and all of my contacts? But unless we actually re read, right, the the use and the guidelines and what we're signing away, we don't know that it's doing that, right? So suddenly everybody, you know, everybody that owns that app or that, you know, that's in charge of that app now can send out, uh, you know, t uh, emails to all of my contacts saying that they're me because I gave them the permission. So it's like you said, we really need to make people aware that they're giving away their own data and that it is our data. You're, it is your stuff. You should be able to decide who has it and who doesn't have it. Um, and, and corporations are having, uh, you know, their IP stolen, uh, people are having their, their ideas stolen and kids are giving it away free. They just don't know it, right? It was a free app and I could, it could, you know, help me to, you know, make my, uh, my photos prettier, you know, and so I could put little ears on my, my thing and stuff, but I, you know, I just clicked yes, because I didn't read the four page document that they sent, right? In the really, really tiny legalese print. Um, but we really need to talk to people about that, right? So, you know, maybe pay the dot buck 99 for that, for that app uh, and get the security features that are involved. Um, we had Zoom problems, right? Where people were Zoom bombing. What was the cure on that? The main cure was if you paid for Zoom, you had the security features to turn off anybody being able to bomb into your, your, your room, right? You could hit the security features. But if you didn't pay for it, if you had the free part, 
you didn't have those 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 things. They've changed it since now, right? So they've updated all that stuff because they had such problems. But again, we're giving it away. So we need to stop doing that. Um, confidentiality and privacy is just one aspect of cybersecurity. Uh, another aspect, another uh, operator in cybersecurity is data integrity. So whenever I sign up for new apps, I always uh, tell them I'm a 21 year old female and you wouldn't believe all the ads, uh, crazy things that I get and uh, by email and pop up on my Google searches. But anyway, so the idea there is that, um, you know, we, we need to understand all those different angles and how, how you, uh, manage your data and your privacy is uh, just one method, one part of cybersecurity. There's other things like how do you make sure that data is authentic and it's coming from who you think it really is. That's another whole new discussion. <laughs> yeah, let's uh, let's have our students create the the new future secure Zoom, right? Have them do that. That would be a, a great project for them. That's kind of the hope, right? Is that we're teaching this so much younger that, that maybe when they're doing the innovation, they'll have this all on lockdown before it's even released. Yeah, that's great. I, I, I love those ideas. We are um, sadly uh, out of time. I know that there were a couple, a question that came in um, at the very end from Shung. Sorry, we didn't get to that. Um, the question was around um, uh, multiple points of, of fail safe, uh, including with autonomous vehicles. But I think that that, that uh, is an important point to remember in system design as well. So sorry, we didn't get to that one, um, but thank you everybody for uh, chiming in with those great questions. Um, thank you to the entire panel this afternoon. Um, I learned some new things, um, even if uh, cybersecurity profession is not in our futures. Um, we all know now to go change our passwords <laughs> um, and be a little bit more savvy about uh, the permissions that we sign um, on our apps. Ooh. I think you muted yourself, uh, Jessica. As an upcoming learning opportunity, wanted to share this um, a seminar that the Michigan Mobility Institute is hosting called Mobility Ready. And this is um, the, a program that will be run on a Saturday morning in April, free for attendees who are interested in better understanding all of the types of jobs that are software focused in mobility. Um, we'll cover basics of what's happening in the industry, have a great panel from some of our employer partners on HR teams, find out about what those jobs are that are in high demand, and then a little bit of a, a focus session on our own career readiness and some of those soft skills that we need to be really successful for the future of this industry. Um, so you can sign up for that at michiganmobilityinstitute.org. Thank you all again. Thank you Detroit SAE section, or excuse me, SAE Detroit section for being part of this today. And with that, we'll let you get on with the rest of your days. Thank you all. Bye-bye.